Marco Corso on this line. You can use specific Mediterranean diets, as in PREDIMED. This was a multi-risk factor intervention. But again, the contribution of LDL lowering to benefit was clear. One of the critical points, one of the critical facts, that our task force for the European Society of Cardiology and the European Atherosclerosis Society took into account in 2010 when we defined our guidelines for the treatment of dyslipidemia was the fact that we know from Professor Nissen in the States that if we can attain an LDL level of the order of 50 to 70 milligrams per deciliter on a statin, then we can stop, in most patients, the progression of atherosclerotic disease. This is why the target for very high risk in our guidelines is 1.7 millimolar. It may, in the future, if there's more trial evidence, be even lower than that. The other comment that Professor Nissen would make to you is that even below 50 milligrams per deciliter, there is always, consistently, a significant number of patients who progress and who require lower LDL levels. Two weeks ago in London, the European Atherosclerosis Society convened a new consensus panel to deliberate the evidence for the causality of LDL in the pathophysiology of atherosclerotic vascular disease. I've summarized the evidence here. There is major new evidence from molecular genetics, but also evidence derived from statin-mediated reduction of LDL. Particularly important, the evidence from FH, but also from the induction of atherosclerosis in experimental animal models. We know that as we go lower with LDL, the characteristics of the plaque become more stable, rupture decreases, and the thickness of the fibrous cap is especially important. So we now have, from imaging studies, the evidence, the lower the LDL, then the characteristics of the plaque become more stable with a higher proportion of fibrous content, thicker fibrous cap, and lower lipid. Now, we all use statins, but we must consider the possibility that the mechanism of action of statins may actually be flawed. So let's look at that. There is a very important paper online in the European Heart Journal from Professor Ridker in Boston, resulting from the Jupiter trial. Professor Wong described to you this morning the American guidelines, the European guidelines. They all have the advantage of focusing on cardiovascular risk. But this slide is a very important one. If you look, this, this slide looks at the distribution of individuals in the Jupiter trial as a function of the percent of LDL lowering. What we have on the right-hand side in dark greeny blue is the fact that there are 46.3% of the individuals in Jupiter with greater than a 50% reduction in LDL. However, 43% had less than a 50% reduction and 11% had no reduction at all. In fact, they even increased their levels of LDL in pink. So I would submit to you that the percent reduction of LDL with any statin can be totally fallacious. We must absolutely follow on an individual basis the response of our patients to a given statin at a given, do given dose because of the major inter-individual variability across individuals independently of ethnicity. We know that one of the major determinants of statin efficacy is the uptake in the liver by the organic ion transporter proteins. And we've just published this paper in the European Heart Journal with the concept of statin escape when the statin is not taken up due to a pharmacogenetic variation in a transporter protein in the liver, it can escape to muscle and trigger attenuated mitochondrial energy production with myositis, myalgia, or myopathy. So we now have a much greater understanding of the pathophysiology, if you will, of uh, muscle-associated symptomatology on statin treatment. And 75% or more of individuals who discontinue statins discontinue because of muscle-associated symptoms. 
here is the pathway whereby statins control the production of, LDL, of the LDL receptor. They reduce cholesterol levels, they induce SRIBB2, there are increased levels of LDL receptors, they take up LDL, and they reduce the concentration of circulating LDL. That's all fine. But we have a major problem. When statins increase the expression of SRIBB2, they also increase the expression of PCSK9. It's a primary or liver protein, which has very high affinity to bind to the LDL receptor. It also binds to LDL itself, but when it binds to the LDL receptor, it triggers the premature suicide, if you will, the premature catabolism breakdown of the LDL receptor. So there are fewer LDL receptors on the surface of the liver cell than there would be normally if statins did not increase the activity or expression of PCSK9. It's a very important concept. This means that if you then knock out PCSK9 therapeutically, you can attain a much more complete upregulation of LDL receptors in the liver. It's a fundamental concept. This is the story of PCSK9. Let's, di let's discuss this in a little more detail now. So PCSK9 is the ninth member of a family of enzymes which activate zymogens, inactive form of enzymes. The difference about PCSK9 is we don't know what its true physiological function is. But what we do know is it undergoes autocat autocatalytic cleavage to release itself from the endoplasmic reticulum in the liver cell and then to become active to ultimately be secreted. Marianne Abbey Fidel from Beirut, working with Catherine Wallow in Paris from 2000 onwards, discovered the first gain of function FH, severe FH patient, and then two families. And those patients were identified by premature disease, but by the absence of any mutation in the LDL receptor or ApoB. And ultimately, thanks to Nabil Saidi in Canada, they were able to identify a mutation in the PCSK9 gene, and they were to link that to, familial, to a familial hypercholesterolemic phenotype in these individuals. Do we have evidence that either lower levels of PCSK9 or higher levels of PCSK9, which are genetically determined, can change cardiovascular risk? Well, indeed we do. On the left, gain of function, where we catalyze increased degradation of LDL receptors. On the right, loss of function, more LDL receptors because of less abundant PCSK9. Here we have on the left gain of function, and you can see that there's a tendency for increased levels of LDL compared to the, to the population mean. Individuals with loss of function, subnormal levels of LDL. We must remember that these mutations are effective as of birth. So these are lifelong effects either of higher or of lower LDL levels according to the mutation. And very importantly, oh dear, I'm sorry. So very importantly, sorry, what we see is a very significant reduction over a lifetime of risk in individuals who carry these loss of function mutations with a low level of LDL. And this was found initially in a Dallas Heart study by Jonathan Cohen and Helen Hobbs. So what you see here is in the individuals with nonsense loss of function mutations in PCSK9, their LDL levels are shifted to the left, to lower levels, with this enormous lifelong benefit in terms of reduction in cardiovascular risk. And this triggered, this information triggered the development of therapeutics targeted to PCSK9. So in about 2004, 2005, the pharmaceutical industry started to target PCSK9. We now have two antibodies approved in Europe and USA. One is Evolucumab or Rapatha, the second is Alirucumab or Praluent, and the third under development is Bocasuzumab and there are other approaches such as small inhibitory RNAs. So basically what the antibody does is to bind circulating PCSK9 
It's taken up by the reticular endothelial system. It spares LDL receptors, and LDL receptors become more abundant on the surface of the liver cell, degrading more LDL. LDL levels fall. Here we see for alarucumab, the time course. Here's the injection as, in this case, alarucumab levels rise. PCSK9 levels in red drop precipitously. This is a single dose. And LDL levels fall subsequently. Just a single dose. And subsequently, as the antibody is used up, LDL levels rise in parallel with rising PCSK9. We see exactly the same thing for evolucumab. Slightly different. The antibodies may have slightly different PK and PD, but essentially the same profile. Whoops, sorry. There are very extensive clinical trial programs involving up to 70,000 patients. On the one hand, for evolucumab, for alirucumab, and for bocasuzumab, they're shown here. Um, most of them are targeted either to individuals with FH or individuals uh, who are dyslipidemic and at high risk. Um, slightly fewer clinical trials in the uh, SPIRE program for uh, bocasuzumab. I think the main point for you today is, in this instance, this is a summary of the uh, efficacy of evolucumab across a number of different patient profiles, including heterozygous FH. The average reductions in LDL, 60, 70 percent. Highly efficacious, on top of a statin. And here we see the additive, the increment on top, uh, or against, sorry, against azitamide. But so we can anticipate, on top of a statin, a mean of the order of 60% additional reduction in LDL. I just looked very briefly at two FH trials. So here we are, heterozygous FH, Rutherford 2, 60% reduction maintained, obviously, either with the von 40 two-week dose or the 420 uh, monthly dose, essentially the same. You clamp LDL levels very low. One of the interesting points, if you look at a number of individuals with heterozygous FH, what you see is a great deal of homogeneity, a relatively narrow range, very high LDL reductions across these patients, far more homogeneous response, for example, than you would see with a statin. So there seems to be a much greater pharmacogenetic effect in statin therapy than there does using these antibodies. These individuals are classified on the basis of their mutation. There is no difference. Independently of the type of mutation, you see the same major uh, response in LDL cholesterol. There's a, a very high uh, attainment of the 70 milligram or 1.8 millimolar uh, goal, uh, even in heterozygous FH patients. This is a major achievement. Here you have uh, individuals with homozygous or compound heterozygous FH. And what we know is that you have to have a small level, a small degree of LDL receptor expression before you will respond to any degree to a PCSK9 inhibitor. So PCSK9 inhibitors absolutely depend on the genetic capacity of individual to express to some degree the LDL receptor. Now, several uh, clinicians, several colleagues have said, well, what about low LDL? Can we go low? Is there a safety profile or not? Well, the answer to that question, if you look across here, so this is going from above 40, so above 1 millimolar, less than 1 millimolar, 0.5 to 1 millimolar, less than 0.6 millimolar. There is no characteristic safety profile, very, very similar to standard of care in the OSLA trial. Obviously, we need more patient years, but the safety at this point in time uh, is very encouraging. Uh, there are no um, hepatic uh, enzyme increases, uh, virtually no impact whatsoever um, on creatine kinase, very safe. And here is uh, a considerably detailed profile um, comparing standard of care with evolucumab and really a, a highly promising safety profile at this point in time. We discussed the European As Association of Study of Diabetes in September. Uh, there's no effect on glycemia. So these agents do, for the moment, appear to be distinct from statins. As you know, long-term, individuals with prediabetes can be pushed over to 
uh, a diabetic profile, um, armostatin long term. These are individuals, some of them have metabolic syndrome, some of them impaired fasting glucose. There seems to be no significant change uh, with this PCSK9 inhibitor, but again, we need, this is a year, but we, we need um, data over a longer time course. Now, one of the questions that's arisen, and this has arisen from the statin trials, on the basis simply of observational data. I'm sorry, I forgot what I said then <laughs> about cognitive impairment. So, basically, um, in the light of the doubt encountered in the statin trials and the fact that a statin trial was never designed to look at the question of cognitive function, this trial uh, is ongoing. It's a trial uh, that's been called Ebbinghaus, evaluating PCSK9 binding antibody influence on cognitive health in high cardiovascular subjects. It's a substudy of the Fourier outcome trial and we hope for results um, at the end of this year or very beginning of 2017, comparing evolucumab on the back of a statin with statin as placebo, either the two weekly or the four weekly uh, injection. So that's gonna be a very important study simply because it's the first one to use the CANTAB uh, criteria, the rigorous clinical criteria for evaluation of cognitive impairment. Now, many of us forget there is one very important confounder for cognitive function. And that was shown by Professor Marmot in London in a Whitehall study. If a male or a female in middle age has a subnormal level of HDL cholesterol, there is a very high degree of prediction that the cognitive performance of that individual will fall over time. So many of these studies are potentially confounded if there is a low level of HDL cholesterol at inclusion. I think uh, Dr. Wong already introduced you. These are very preliminary data from OSLA, uh, preliminary data from the Odyssey outcomes, but they're very suggestive that there will be uh, a major impact, favorable impact on the reduction of morbid mortality in individuals with these um, PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, the trial's ongoing, uh, Fourier uh, with Evolucumab, uh, this is a high-risk population with incident disease, uh, primary secondary, pr uh, primarily secondary prevention, excuse me, Odyssey, acute coronary syndromes, SPIRE 1, SPIRE 2, a mixture of high-risk individuals. So we're going to have information across a spectrum of high-risk patients. I'd just make one comment. Those of you who will go to the European Society of Cardiology meeting in Rome, will be privileged to hear the results of the first imaging trial with the PCSK9 inhibitor. Uh, Professor Nissen, Professor Nichols, the GLAGOF trial, using intravascular ultrasound to look at uh, plaque volume over time, I think it's 18 months, in 1,000 individuals uh, in the GLAGOF trial. So that will be important for all of us. Um, the uh, injection possibilities here are 140 milligrams every two weeks or 420 every month. They give equivalent uh, reductions uh, in LDL cholesterol. We should note that uh, whichever antibody it is, they're destined for subcutaneous injection, and those injections, um, the, um, both of the producers of the antibodies at the moment use these injector pens, very similar to those that are used currently by diabetics to inject insulin. Um, obviously, um, I think there are multiple injections for the 420 and a single injection for the 140 dose in a one, milli, one milliliter solution. So where are we? Which patients should be prioritized for PCSK9 inhibitors? Well, our friends in the United States would say this is a no-brainer. Obviously, it's FH individuals. They have a lifelong exposure to high LDL, many of them at very high risk, particularly the uh, compound heterozygotes and homozygotes. The second category, very high risk CV patients, particularly those that not at goal with incident disease, particularly those who don't respond well to statins and whose disease progresses as determined, for example, either by events or by imaging technologies. And then this category, certainly the third priority for myself, uh, and I'd be happy to discuss uh, statin intolerance, particularly statin-associated muscular symptoms with you, if you wish. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, 
Uh, next slide. Uh, basically, I think that uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, so Mohammed already discussed why LDL targets are not achieved. You're already aware of all of those difficulties that we encounter every day. The LDL cholesterol burden, particularly important, why? Because the threshold Chapman, maybe you can use the mouse and uh, Sorry. the microphone. So, so this is Professor Vickman has shown in Holland, early introduction of statin in children can significantly de delay events, even in the most severe homozygous FH children who may express with an event before the age of 15 years. We can equally obviously delay disease symptomatology in individuals with heterozygous FH again by intervening as early as possible uh, and we must always take into account the impact of the risk factor profile. How early should we start? Colleagues are now starting from six to eight years of age in FH children and I can also share with you the fact that a, a, a new study in children, a pediatric study has just been started in Holland with PCSK9 inhibitors. And this is the uh, article which we published last year in the European Heart Journal with Professor Vickman looking at this whole question. Can we treat FH children and adolescents and can we bring a gain of decades of life, of healthy life, to those children by optimizing detection and treatment? And the answer is certainly yes. Two years ago, Professor Ginsberg in, in, in New York and myself felt the need to create a freely accessible site of information, education in the PCSK9 field, www.pcsk9forum.org. So we welcome you to take advantage, downloadable slides, presentations, so on and so forth. So we find ourselves in this situation. We have the statins as first line, azitamibe now shown to decrease events and improve it, very few now use resins. Hypertriglyceridemic individuals are a choice. These are only used in very severe FH due to their very high cost. And now we have the arrival of these agents. And of course, they hold the promise to really attenuate disease and events in individuals at high and very high risk. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I'd simply like to thank Amgen for, for making it possible for me to join you in Q8. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Chapman. So we'll open the ground now for questions. I'll start with a question for Professor Chapman. Sometimes patients come back to us with very low LDL levels and they are panicking, you know, that maybe it's harmful to have uh, LDL level very low or less than one. What's your intake on that? Well, the first point would be that everyone in this room <coughs> was born normally, with the exception of FH carriers, with a level of LDL less than one millimolar and HDL cholesterol levels slightly higher. So that's at a time postnatally when we're developing our central nervous system and various organs and tissues and we need cholesterol and, a, and LDL is clearly not, not the supplier under those conditions or at least local production of cholesterol is sufficient. So clearly we have levels of LDL far in excess of our requirements. We know for example in the adrenals for steroid hormones HDL can substitute for, L, for LDL. So there seems every uh, argument, there seem to be many arguments for the statement that we have excess LDL cholesterol in our circulation as adults, both as males and females, and that it is deleterious ultimately in individuals either who are genetically predisposed or who have a very high risk factor profile. Thank you, Professor Chapman, for your excellent presentation. My question is about uh, what's the role of PCK9 inhibitors, you think, in the latest recommendation from the uh, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology in 2013, 
which uh, mentioned about talking about the uh, non uh, clinical proven benefit of uh, joining combination therapy on top of a statin, al also the abandoning of the uh, LDL cutoffs and uh, treating based on intensity of a statin. So wh where PCK9 inhibitors will stand in terms of this, those guidelines? Okay. Well, we, we're going to have to be very careful about the use of the term high-intensity statins. You saw that in the Jupiter trial, you can have a, a neutral statin, you can have a low-potency statin, and you can have a high-potency statin. It's all the same statin at the same dose. So we need to integrate the notion that no two individuals give the same response to any given statin at every, any given dose. We need to follow our patients, I think, much more than we do to monitor response, to bring them the maximum benefit initially from statin-mediated LDL lowering. So I think we need to be very, very careful about this terminology of high, me moderate, and so forth, um, stati intensity statins. Um, so that would be the first point. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you very well. Could you just? Sure, I can repeat the question. Now, with the uh, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, 2013 recommendation about using LDL targets as a target for uh, statin therapy in patients for primary and secondary prevention. Now, the, these guidelines have abandoned the targets of LDL for which you want to use certain um, statin therapy. Now, where you think the PCK9 inhibitors would be in those guidelines, especially with the non-recommendation of using combination therapy with statins in treating those patients? Well, I think, do you mind if we step back a little from your question? In the article that Professor Ridk has just published, the statement he makes is that what we actually should be doing in clinical practice is looking both at the percent reduction and, and the LDL goal. So in other words, I hope we're coming together across the Atlantic. Clearly, we need to look at percent reduction. It's very useful in monitoring patient response, but ultimately it's goal that counts. So let's just hope that we can move together uh, and that the potential, how should we say, d difference of strategy will not um, lead, how can I say, to, 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 uh, to, 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 to reduction in the potential benefit of our patients. I think you know, that this is where we want to be. So is that answering your question? Yes. yes, yes. Thank you so much. But perhaps I can just add a sure. little point. I think, uh, Victor Tamer, when the uh, guidelines are also put in, um, the, the, the guidelines people, and Dr. Chaplin is well aware uh, of this, he's been involved in many, they want uh, final results from phase three randomized trials to add in the, 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 the drug or the class of drug in their recommendation. So in 2013, for example, I don't think the Improve It data was out, and they sort of did not recommend ezetimibe, for example, and definitely the PCS K9 data are not out, and they're not out right now either, not all of them. So it would be difficult for the guidelines to uh, have, have recommended something that has not being established in phase three trials. Is that, is that a fair statement? Uh, I, 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 I guess it is. The difficulty we have is that um, clinical trials and publication of data always move much more rapidly than the guidelines. And the major difference between the approach of the ACC AHA committee, as I'm sure you're aware, was to restrict their deliberations to data, as you've said, Mohammed, from randomized control trials. Now, the members of our ESC ES task force were of a very, very strong opinion that we should not restrict ourselves to randomized control trials, and everyone in this room will know that a randomized control trial does not represent real medicine. So, so it, it, it's, it's a critical point. Therefore, in our guidelines, we included all of the studies, all of the, all the studies we considered clinically valid in the consideration for the guidelines proposal. Can we take more two, uh, two more questions, uh, Musa? Thank you very much, Professor Chaplin, for the nice presentation.
presentation, I have a couple of questions. Is really, you know, one of the advantages of um, using a high dose of a statin is the anti-inflammatory effects or pleiotropic effects, especially in acute current syndrome. So is the LDL lowering effect by PSSK9 inhibitor does ha really does have the uh, uh, anti-inflammatory effects, especially if we are enrolling patient with acute coronary syndrome. Or we should consider that it is effective even with the anti-inflammatory effects as the high dose of a statin. Well, M Musa, um, the scientific information, the scientific evidence we have at this time is that it's the modification of LDL and the uptake of LDL into the macrophage to make the foam cell that is the critical component in driving intraplaque inflammation. And when you attenuate foam cell accumulation of cholesterol by attenuating LDL cholesterol levels, you then attenuate in inter inflammatory, uh, intraplaque inflammation. So I think that the effects of statins, for example, on the endothelium, we, we know that they lead to a protection of nitric oxide. But the great, great difficulty that I'm sure all of us appreciate is no one, but no one, has been able to demonstrate a clinical contribution of a pleiotropic effect from a statin to clinical benefit. So we, we have a, uh, we're up a gum tree, as we say. We have a hypothesis, but we have no proof for the pleiotropic effects as contributors to the decrease in cardiovascular events. The last however, however, we can fully anticipate that the PCSK9 inhibitors will decrease intraplaque inflammation due to their imp impact on, on reducing LDL. Sorry, Musa. The last question is how low we can go low fast before, you know, there, there's an issue, a couple of incidents in one of the PSSK inhibitor trials that they discovered some neurocognitive impairment. But how low we can go before we consider, you know, there is a safety margin, should we not go beyond, beyond that lower, in s specifically to avoid this in neurocognitive disease? Yeah, so, so Musa, I think we've got to be very, very careful, very prudent when we talk about signals for cognitive impairment in the PCSK9 trials. The numbers are very, very small. The trials were not designed with satisfactory clinical evaluation of cognitive performance. That will now be done in Ebbing House, so I think we need to be very, very careful about the small, totally observational. And the same goes for the statins. So we need hard data, and hopefully we'll have, you know, from Ebbing House towards the end, or, or even, even the end of this year, beginning next year. And with respect to how low we can go, well, you know, there are data now that show there's no effect on steroid hormone levels as go of, uh, when you even go to 25, to, to almost to 0.5 millimolar with LDL cholesterol with a PCSK9 inhibitor that was published recently. So at the moment, we don't have any significant adverse effect signal. We need more patient years. We don't have the answer. And I'm sure that the trialists will be very, very thorough in evaluating the questions, you know, that you've posed. Okay, last question there. Question of presentation, but oh, we need more information. The goal is LDL cholesterol, but what about affecting of PCSK9 inhibitors to level of, for, uh, for example, uh, LT little a or even more important ratio of HEPO B, HEPO A1? Well, essentially, uh, data will be published very shortly by Professor Stein showing that Evolucumab very effectively reduces levels of triglyceride rich atherogenic lipoproteins. Um, there's also data for Alirucumab. Um, we all, we're all aware of the fact that LP little A is reduced by about 30% by these PCSK9 inhibitors through a pathway we don't completely understand. The problem with LP little A is we don't have an intervention trial to show that when we reduce LP little A significantly in high-risk individuals with high LP little A levels at baseline that we confer benefit. That may come from the antisense oligonucleotide tried trial against APO little A which reduces LPA by 80% specifically. So it's going to be very difficult from these trials with the PCSK9 inhibitors to make 
conclusions about the efficacy or the cardiovas cardiovascular benefit of l pitidyl a lowering. Clearly, it is an atherogenic particle at levels above 80 to 100 milligrams per deciliter, no doubt about it. Okay, about uh, APOB and APOA1? Well, a a APOB and APOA1 are excellent markers. Uh, a ratio of APOB to APOA1 can be actually um, misleading because you can have high levels of, of APOB, but and if you look at the ratio, you're not going to know that. APOB is a very, it's an excellent marker for the number of atherogenic lipoproteins. Uh, Salim Yusuf did it in the Interheart trial, look at the results. Personally, I think in the future, we're going to move away from LDL cholesterol. We will move to APOB because it gives us a measure of the number of atherogenic lipoproteins in plasma. APOA1 is essentially the same. Most HDL particles contain four copies of APOA1. So, and those assays are more reliable and more sensitive, more reproducible than the type of direct LDL or direct HDL that's used in clinical laboratories at the moment. Is that your question? Okay, John, let's quickly just ask a question for you for the Q100. Since we're going to have one of the DCSK9 medication, namely Ribata, available in our hospitals in a few months, I mean, do we need genetic testing? And uh, is there a clear a clinical criteria before we, uh, to start this medication in our patients? Hamad, maybe you want to start this? Um, I am a bit conservative, or maybe a lot conservative. And uh, I would say at this stage, personally, I would keep it for the very high risk patients, almost what I say is compassionate, or where it's proven in familial hypercholesterolemia, probably the homozygous. Um, the rest of the population, the higher risk populations, I realize the importance of lowering LDL, but I'd like to wait for the uh, phase three trials to come out to understand how much it, it, it improves things and the impact on clinical outcome. Uh, not denying its importance in the FH or homozygous population. Okay. So, so um, essentially around the world, what we're doing is treating a phenotype. We're treating a high LDL cholesterol phenotype. Um, it can be said that the genetics of high LDL cholesterol are becoming more and more complicated. I think many of you will know there are more, and one, more than 1,500 different mutations identified to date in the LDL receptor gene. So um, I, I don't think it's reasonable to envisage that genotyping would be necessary to have access to these highly efficacious agents, and it shouldn't be a barrier in these very high-risk uh, FH individuals particularly. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chapman. Thank you, Professor Zubaid. And thanks to Amgen for uh, setting this symposium. Uh, thank you all. Uh, just a quick uh, housekeeping announcement. Lunch is served now uh, in just at the end of this hall. And uh, please be back uh, for the next lecture. We're going to start at uh, 3 o'clock sharp. Thank you. We are going to start our first session uh, for today. Uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Walid Al-Bahi. He will get a talk about the treatment of diabetes type 2 in the year of 2016. It's about the advances, challenges, and opportunities. Dr. Walid is a graduate of Kuwait University. He completed his uh, postgraduate uh, studying in uh, Canada, and he's a fellow of Johnston Diabetes Center. He's the consultant endocrinologist as well as diabetologist in Mubarak al Kabir Hospital, as well as he's the director of the Kuwaiti Board of Diabetes and Endocrine. Dr. Walid, you are most welcome. Thank you, Dr. Mawli. Good evening, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. And thank you, Dr. Mawli, for your kind introduction. And KMA for inviting me to get into this interesting uh, conference. I just, how shall I change the slide? Touch screen or? Clip on now. This is your move. Okay. Okay. So, as you know, diabetes is one of the most common diseases um, 
around the world, and it was one of the, what we call the non-communicable diseases. And I wanted to start my lecture with this slide to show how bad is diabetes causing lots of mortality compared to um, uh, many diseases that we think that actually it kills uh, our patients. And you can see here that for patients with diabetes, both male and female, you know, the coronary heart disease mortality is higher if you are diabetes. And this is one of the major causes of death in diabetes. We know from the International Diabetes Federation that, you know, half of our people that die of diabetes die at the age of 60. And that is a very serious finding because, you know, most of these patients are, are, are dead people are actually in their active life. Uh, you know, imagine somebody in the 60, he's a grandfather, he's on top of his work. Most of these people lose their life because of diabetes. And we know it's a growing disease in the world, in, in our area, and also in the world. We can see the figures are so huge. We have around 35 million around our area in the Middle East, and also, you know, lots around the world, causing around 382 million people suffering of diabetes. That's according to the International Diabetes Federation. If you look at our area in particular, 9.2% of the world incidence occurs in the Middle East. One in nine have diabetes and an average prevalence of around 11%. When you look at the Middle East again with the projection in the future till year 2035, you can see that the number is gonna be doubled. So this is a very significant um, uh, disease, non-communicable disease in our area. The highest uh, number of patients suffering of diabetes in the Middle East is Egypt, at around 7.5 million people, you can see it down here, okay? And you can see compared to the others, Saudi Arabia in our area also have around 300, uh, 3 million point eight uh, patients with, uh, with diabetes. And also, the prevalence is estimated to, is, is going up with age. And you can see as our uh, countries are becoming more modern, our age increase, our life expectancy increase, and also diabetes increase with it. And you can see here from the age of 50 and above, I'm not used to using a mouse, I'm sorry. From 50 and above, you can see that here, the, the, the rate of diabetes, the prevalence, increase exponentially. So this is a very um, uh, important disease in our area. And half of the people actually don't know that they have diabetes. And this is one of the significant findings we see around the world, and especially in our area. And you can see comparing to in the Middle East, we have a significant number of people also, they don't have that they have uh, diabetes. And this is also another population that we don't know anything about. We don't know what's going to go and uh, happen to them. We don't know the rate of transfer to diabetes, and it's going to be very high. If you look at the, our area in particular, this is in the GCC uh, countries. This is a, a study done by Professor Nabila back in the 1998, and you can see here the prevalence of diabetes at that time was, you know, at 77 percent, and then around 80 to 12 percent, and later in the 90s reached on, at 15.7 percent. So there's a, a doubling of, of, um, of the uh, prevalence in 20 years. And <clears throat> now if you look at our area, you can see on the top here, Kuwait is around 23% with Qatar and Saudi Arabia around 24%. So that's also another big increase in another 20 years. And we expect this increase to be, you know, in the next 35, uh, 20 years to be also a very significant increase in, in the prevalence of diabetes. So this is Kuwait on the top 10 country in the world ranging around 23%. Now every year the, the, the ranking changes, but actually the percentage is increasing. The reason is because there are many countries actually have their numbers you know, changed or actually out of the list. That's why we are one day on the third, one day on the sixth, and one day on the ninth. But the actual sad fa fact is that the number of prevalence is increasing over time since the 70s, um, uh, since the 70s. So this is how it looked like in the GCC, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, and these are also included in the top 10 list of the highest prevalence. In Kuwait, we have around 424,000 patients suffering from diabetes. That's a big um, number 
uh, that we have, and we, we see that in our everyday. That's why our people, when they talk about diabetes, they say, if you are not Kuwaiti, if you don't have diabetes, you're not Kuwaiti. So this is um, a joke that we hear it every day, but it's a very, a very, very sad joke because the disease is there in every home. And bird glucose tolerance, which is just a state before diabetes, is also very common. And here, Kuwait actually on the top 10 countries, top, sorry, on the top, um, you know, uh, at a range of 18%. So this is in bird fasting glucose, which is significantly, you know, um, we see it in our population. You know, primary care physicians usually see it, but unfortunately these patients are lost because there's no programs for screening or looking in particular for these people. So why is the Gulf having this high prevalence of diabetes? Yeah, this is a pedigree from uh, Saudi Arabia, given by a colleague in Saudi Arabia. And just to make it simple for you, this is, you know, people with uh, red are affected, uh, and you can see here, just look at the bottom, you can see many reds in the children. And this is one of the issues that actually now is emerging to the surface and the challenge is that our children now are developing diabetes. It's not only elderly at age of 60 and 70, it's only children also are actually developing diabetes and like father, like son, obesity is one of the major issues. This is um, a study from United Arab Emirates showing how much overweight male and female highlighted here and you can see that, sorry. So you can see overweight in the male and female, and also low physical activity is, is very high compared to, um, um, you know, uh, as an average on this cohort. If you look at, this is from Kuwait, you can see that physical inactivity in type two diabetes is very high compared to um, other uh, populations. So physical inactivity is one of the issues that we see. This is again another showing a study looking at you know, level of activity less than 10 minutes. And you can see here, uh, we always, you know, see Iraq, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Kuwait, and Oman, and Kuwait ranks around 64.7 of the population of this study told that they have physical inactivity, less than 10 minute activity a day. And this is one of the major issues and probably one of the risk factors why we have this high prevalence. Another um, interesting finding uh, is the, uh, the reason for physical activity is because of the culture and also because of the weather. And you can see here Kuwait actually is the hottest in the area. From May, you know, till September, we have the highest actually uh, temperature and you can see here it's called extreme danger compared to the other areas. And this is, I just picked it up from this website. It just shows the temperatures around the world. So this is one of the issues that you know um, actually makes people physically inactive and don't go out outdoors. There are many other reasons, but this is one of it. And also, health expenditure is not much. We always complain about you know lots of money going around, uh, probably not in the right direction. But you know, you can see here that health health expenditure in the USA compared just what happened in USA here, Germany here, and Kuwait is here. So Spain,